Recently, I sat down and asked myself, what are the elements that make a great story? And I came up with seven. So this is just uh, for me thinking about it. I didn't done any research or anything like that. Um, so I came up with seven elements for great storytelling. Okay, so the number one thing at its core is writing. Your writing has to be very strong. Uh, this is, you know, the technical components of, you know, mastering grammar and uh, punctuation, spelling, all that kind of stuff. But there's also a certain clarity and purpose and fluidity to writing where when you read it it's kind of effortless and and that takes years and years of practice in fact you can read really good writing and it seems very simple their ideas are very purposeful and organized uh, i can tell even though it looks very simple and very easy i can tell that this person has years and years of practice writing uh, in his book on writing stephen king says the first million words are practice and I think that's roughly true. This is actually an encouraging thing because, you know, as writers, you don't have to be, you know, have some innate talent, uh, you know, like LeBron James. You could just show up every day and practice and you'll eventually become good at writing. Okay, so the second element that I've identified to make great storytelling is originality. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfectly original, just somewhat original. Uh, you know, a lot of writers, we often borrow ideas from other mediums, you know, movies or books or, or whatever. Uh, in my book, Prodigy, uh, I'm helping myself to a lot of concepts that were talked about in Plato's Republic. You know, I have a philosophy background and, and I pay homage to Plato's Republic in this book. If you kind of pay attention, I even mention at one point in the book, um, one of the characters is reading the Plato's Republic. This is a slight nod to let people know like, hey, I'm not stealing these ideas. I'm, I'm borrowing it and paying homage to it. It's like a modern telling of Plato's Republic. Uh, everything. If you look at a lot of stories, they're they're not completely 100% original. They're somewhat original. So to be original, to come up with original ideas, I've talked about this in other videos, but I think it has to do with having a depth and a breadth of knowledge. And this comes from you know podcasts, uh, books, movies, traveling, hanging out with interesting people, um, you know documentaries, having conversations, and immersing yourself in different things that maybe you'd otherwise say no to. So maybe somebody invites you to a party or maybe it's an article about something that uh, is against your own beliefs. Um, I'm often kind of chasing whimsies and following, going down rabbit holes, different articles, just to kind of give myself more information so I can come up with either uh, more original ideas, um, connect dots in certain ways that I may not otherwise have considered. So. Um, I think coming up with original ideas has a lot to do with, um, with knowledge and experience. So the third element that I've defined for great storytelling is characters. So your characters need to be very well defined. Um, they have to have different voices, unique personalities, unique interests, unique motivations. And your reader should be able to tell who's speaking just based on the character. So, okay, the fourth thing that I've identified is pacing. So if your story takes forever to kind of get into that inciting incident or the arc is just so long and drawn out, it's gonna turn a lot of people off. What I like to do is have like action beats every scene or every uh, you know couple chapters, you have something uh, dramatic happen and kind of propel and, and um, give the story momentum. Yeah, so I think poor writing is, uh, is writing that uh, doesn't kind of take pace into consideration and um, you know, I can think of some examples where uh, it takes forever to get into the book. Um, off the top of my head, uh, Fight Club is a good example. You know, you can get 130 pages into that book and they never talk about Fight Club. It's, you know, this guy being a waiter and um, yeah, I, I don't really like that book. Another example I can think of is Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, another classic book, and, uh, but it didn't really work for me. It takes forever to get into the actual, the main plot of the book. Um, it just opens with kind of these random scenes and introduced new characters. And the first half of the book, I couldn't even tell you who the main character was. It was, you know, just kind of all over the place and I, I felt that the pacing was off. Okay, so the fifth thing that I've identified kind of relates to pacing is the story arc. You know, the overarching plot of your story. What happens? I think by nature, human beings are really into suspense. We like kind of that tension that's created. Uh, what I like to do is kind of create these um, scenes where, you know, the reader is kind of swinging from vine to vine like a, like a monkey in a jungle. And so as one scene is winding down, there's another 
vine to reach out and grab onto, and that'll kind of bring them on throughout the journey of the story. There's actually an author named David Mamet who wrote this really articulate, wonderful essay called The Three Uses of the Knife on the Nature and Purpose of Drama. And he articulates um, you know, the kind of arc of storytelling beautifully. So I'm just gonna read you a little bit of passage from the essay where he talks about the perfect baseball game. What, we, what do we wish for in the perfect baseball game? Do we wish for our team to take the field and thrash the opposition from the first moment to the final gun? No, we actually wish for a closely fought match that contains many satisfying reversals, but which can be seen retroactively to always tend toward a satisfying and inevitable conclusion. We wish, in effect, for a three-act structure. In Act 1, our team takes the field and indeed prevails over its opponents, and we, its participants, feel pride. But before the pride can mature into arrogance, this new thing occurs. Our team makes an error. The other side is inspired and pushes forward with previously unsuspected strength and imagination. Our team weakens and retreats. In Act 2 of this perfect game, our team is shaken and confused. They forget the rudiments of cohesion and strategy and address that made them strong. They fall deeper and deeper into a slew of despond. All contrary efforts seem not. And just when we think the tide may have turned back the other way, a penalty or adverse decision is rendered, nullifying their games. What could be worse? But wait, just when all else seems irredeemably lost, help comes, which is Act 3. A player, previously believed to be second-rate, emerges from the block, a throw, a run, and offers a glimmer of the possibility of victory. Yes, only a glimmer, but it is sufficient to rouse the team to something approaching its best efforts, and the team indeed rallies. Our team brings the score back even and makes the play that would put them ahead, only to have it called back yet again by fate or by its lieutenant, a wrong-headed, ignorant, or malicious official. I'll stop there because it, it goes on, but the point is that there's this constant ebb and flow, this tension, this the winning team, the story that we actually aspire to read or to consume is not the hero just dominating and, and destroying. It's this arc of the heroes may be weak at the beginning and they maybe meet mentors along the way and, and uh, receive knowledge that actually makes them stronger and rises to the, uh, the occasion and rises to the challenge, you know, really address the call to adventure. And then through this kind of growth, we see the character becoming strong, but only to have maybe their ignorance or their uh, arrogance or weakness um, maybe make them fail. They, they must first fail before they succeed. So it's this kind of back and forth that takes us on this journey to an ultimately satisfying conclusion. Speaking of conclusion, this is number six. So if you want to have a great story, even if everything up until the conclusion is really rock solid, your conclusion has to be satisfying. It has to have that payoff. Um, I can think of some examples of books where the ending just doesn't pay off or it's just so long and drawn out but that, you know, readers, I mean, for me at least, I get bored and discouraged and I just think, okay, wrap it up already. I don't care. This, is, this, this was a great book, uh, but the ending is just too long and convoluted and I lose interest. However, there are some endings that are just so satisfying that kind of leave you begging for more. They, they want you to tell their friends um, and you know, go on to uh, Google and search to see if there's a sequel to be written. Um, you know, they're just so powerful. So I think uh, you know, with that said, conclusions are, are very important. And so for that reason, conclusion is number six on my list. Okay, lastly, the seventh element is timing. So you have this great book. You have a good book. To make it great, I think you need to have well-timed either comedic humor or some tension or some break. Uh, almost like a stand-up comedian will know exactly when to say the punchline. I think books also have to have this. So. A really uh, Marvel does this beautifully. They have this, you know, action scene, this really drawn out uh, dramatic scene, and then they'll have uh, some humor mixed in, and it just makes it so wonderful, and it kind of draws us in. Okay, so there it is, my seven elements of great storytelling. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you agree with me, or if you disagree with me, or uh, if there's any I missed, um, let me know. Uh, also, if you like this video, please hit the like button. If you want to watch more videos like this, uh, 
you know, where I'm talking about writing, please hit the subscribe button. And thanks again for watching and I'll see you next week.